Welcome to the Illinois State Board of Elections Division of Campaign Disclosure tutorial on the Statement of Organization. In this lesson, we will learn how to both complete and file a Statement of Organization, also known as a Form D-1. To review, any group that accepts contributions or makes expenditures or independent expenditures for political purposes in excess of $5,000 within a 12-month period must register as a committee with the State Board of Elections. Additionally, any group wishing to establish a political party committee must register once the political party is created, as this committee type does not have a $5,000 threshold. Therefore, this type of committee must report from Penny One. If any of these conditions are met, then your group must register with the Board of Elections by filing a D-1. For more information regarding the registration thresholds, please see our tutorial on who is covered by the Act. The Statement of Organization can be found by going to the State Board of Elections website, elections.il.gov. Once there, you'll notice a series of tabs across the top of the screen. Choose the tab second from the left that reads Campaign Disclosure. From there, in the middle section of the Campaign Disclosure options is the Forms section, and the Statement of Organization Form D-1 will be the first one listed. The Statement of Organization will pull up as a fillable PDF. We now have the form. Let's learn how to fill it out. The first section of the D-1 is the header section. In this section, you will find a place to put the full name and current mailing address of the committee. It's important to ensure the address chosen for the committee is one that is checked often because all official committee mailings will be sent to that address. In addition, you will find a small checkbox for changing the address of an existing committee, as well as a checkbox to indicate you want to receive report notifications via email only. If you choose that option, please remember to include a valid email address in the space provided. The political committee identification number is something that's assigned by the board once you file the D-1. So if you're creating a new committee, just ignore that box. If you are amending a D-1 for an existing committee, you can enter your ID number if you know it, but it's not essential. Moving on from the header section, Section 1 is where your committee will indicate what action it is trying to accomplish with this form. If you're registering a new committee, check the box for new committee. If making an amendment to an existing committee, check amendment. And finally, if reactivating a previously finalized committee, check their reactivating box. If making an amendment after this point, you only need to fill out the sections of the D-1 that are being amended. However, if you're registering a new committee or reactivating an old committee, you'll want to fill out the entirety of the D-1 to give us all the current information regarding your group. Sections 2 and 3 are a little more challenging, and this is where errors are most likely to occur. These sections are where you will indicate your committee's creation date and creation amount. The creation date is the date your committee crossed the $5,000 threshold, or the date the committee voluntarily decided to file the D-1 early. The committee's creation amount is the fund balance the committee had available as of the creation date. These two pieces of information can be a little confusing, so let's go over a few examples together. Example 1. In this example, your group has gone out and raised $5,000 in contributions and is therefore right at the threshold. Then another contribution for $500 is deposited, taking your committee across the threshold. Your committee must now file a D-1. In this example, the creation date would be the date the committee received the $500 contribution, taking it over the threshold, and the creation amount would be $5,000, because that's the amount the committee had available prior to crossing the threshold. The $500 contribution would be the first transaction chronologically to be disclosed on its quarterly report. Example 2. In this example, the committee has raised and deposited $5,000 in contributions and has spent $600 on printing, leaving the committee with a balance of $4,400. Then a $500 contribution is received and deposited, taking the committee over their receipt threshold. 
In this example, the committee's creation date would be the date the committee deposited the $500 contribution that took it over the threshold. The creation amount would be $4,400 because that's what the committee had available as of the date the committee crossed the threshold. Like in example one, the $500 contribution that took the committee over the threshold would be reported on the committee's first quarterly report. Example three. In this example, the committee decides to put some money into the committee to get it started by depositing $6,000 in a single transaction. That deposit is in excess of the $5,000 threshold, thus taking it over the threshold. In this case, the committee's creation date is the date the committee deposited the $6,000, and the committee's creation amount would be zero. In this example, the $6,000 would be the first transaction reported on a quarterly report, and due to the amount, would also require an A-1 report to be filed. We'll get more into the A-1 reports in a later tutorial. In the final example, the group has raised less than $5,000, but has decided to register prior to crossing the threshold. In this case, the creation date would be the date the committee files the statement of organization, and the creation amount would be whatever amount the committee had at the time they were filing early. Special note, if your committee decides to register before crossing the threshold, the threshold amount becomes irrelevant, and the committee will be required to disclose all activity going forward from its date of creation, even if it never exceeds the $5,000 threshold. Please keep in mind that whatever creation date you list on your committee's D1 Statement of Organization will be the starting date for the committee's reporting obligations. So receipt and expenditure information will have to be reported from that date forward, and the first quarterly report your committee has to file will be based on that creation date. With a better understanding of the committee's creation date and amount, let's continue filling out the D1. The next section is where your group will indicate your committee designation. There are five such designations in the state of Illinois. They are candidate political committees, political action committees, political party committees, ballot initiative committees, and independent expenditure committees. There is also a sixth type called a limited activity committee, which can only be created from an existing candidate committee. So we'll skip that for now. As you can see, each committee designation is unique. A candidate political committee is, as the name implies, a committee set up by a single candidate. Only candidate committees can contain the name of the candidate within the name of the committee. The committee can support an individual for more than one office, but if the multiple offices being sought are elected during different election cycles, then the candidate must designate the current election cycle to be used for the committee. Additionally, candidates cannot have multiple committees set up to support themselves for the same office. If the candidate sets up multiple committees, one for each different office, then the name of each committee must include the name of the candidate along with the office being sought. Political action committees, on the other hand, may be established by any person or group other than a candidate or party to support or oppose a candidate or candidates. The name of the political action committee must include the name of the group or individuals responsible for its formation, unless the committee is to support multiple candidates, in which case it must contain the jurisdiction the candidates are running in and the offices that are being sought. Additionally, a candidate cannot form both a candidate committee and a political action committee to support their own candidacy. A particular person or group can only establish one political action committee at any given time, unless the other committee is an independent expenditure committee. The third committee type is a political party committee. A political party committee may be formed by a new political party or the state or county central committee of a party, a legislative caucus committee, or by the ward or township committee men of a political party. The name of a party committee must include the name of the political party that forms it. Each state, county, ward, or township group can only create one political party committee. The next committee designation is a ballot initiative committee. This is a committee formed by a person or group to support or oppose a question of public policy to be placed on the ballot. 
The name of a ballot initiative committee has to include a brief description of the public policy question and whether the committee is supporting or opposing it. The last committee designation is for independent expenditure committees. An independent expenditure committee is a committee that is formed for the purpose of making independent expenditures in support of or in opposition to any public official candidate or question of public policy to be submitted to the voters. Independent expenditure committees include groups that make electioneering communications that are not coordinated with a public official, candidate, or their campaigns. Moving down the D1 form, Section 5 is where your committee will designate the area it will primarily operate in, along with any party affiliation and sponsoring entity, if applicable. A sponsoring entity is any person, group, organization, corporation, or association other than a political committee that contributes at least 33% of the total funding of a political committee. Next, Section 6 is where the committee will declare a general or specific purpose for the committee being established. An example of a committee's purpose might be to support candidate A for the Illinois House of Representatives. Moving on, Section 7 is where your committee will list any candidate or candidates it's established to support or oppose, along with the office or offices being sought. Please be sure to include complete and accurate information for each candidate. Section 8 of the Statement of Organization is among the most important. In this section, the committee will designate who will serve as officers of the committee. The same individual, including the candidate, may serve as both committee chair and treasurer, except for judicial candidates who cannot be an officer of a committee. Both the chair and treasurer positions must be filled in order to conduct financial transactions. Furthermore, accurate current contact information, including the address, phone number, and email address of both officers, is critical, as the committee officers will serve as the main points of contact with the state board. For more information on officers, please see our tutorial on who is covered by the Act. Sections 9 through 11 are the last ones on the Statement of Organization. Section 9 is where your committee will designate the name of any person other than a committee officer who will handle the committee's financials, such as an accountant or campaign manager. A custodian is not required, so if you don't have one, just leave this section blank. Section 10 of the Statement of Organization is where your committee will list the name and contact information for the financial institution acting as a repository for committee funds. Some institutions will not allow a political committee to open an account without a D-1 being on file. If this is the case, indicate the information of the financial institution the committee plans to use, even if the account has not been opened yet. An amendment to the D-1 can always be filed should any of this information change at a later date. Finally, Section 11 is where the committee will designate what they plan to do with residual funds in the event that the committee decides to close. The committee may choose to either return the contributions to its contributors, not to exceed the amount of the original contributions, transfer the funds to another political committee or committees, or transfer the funds to charity. Once the Statement of Organization form has been completed, it will need to be signed. There are three separate lines to sign, depending on the committee's designation. The top signature line is for the signature of the committee chair for ballot initiative committees only. The middle signature line is only for the signature of the committee chair for independent expenditure committees. The bottom signature line is for all committees. It requires the signature of either the treasurer or candidate of the committee. Ballot initiative committee and independent expenditure committees will need the committee treasurer's signature here, in addition to the chair's signature above. Now that you have learned how to complete a D1, let's quickly look at how to make an amendment to an existing committee. You'll need the same D1 form as referenced in this tutorial. Make sure to have your committee's name and address in the top header and amendment marked in Section 1. From there, you will only need to fill out the information that's changing from the original D1. 
For example, if your committee was making an amendment to change the committee treasurer, you would only need to fill out the treasurer information in Section 8. Once you have your committee's name and address, amendment marked in Section 1, and any other changing information filled out, simply sign and file the amended statement of organization. Please remember it's very important to keep your committee's information on file with the State Board of Elections up to date. The information provided on your D1 is what we will use to contact you about problems with a report, reporting deadline reminders, penalties, and appeal information, and important changes to the law. If your D1 information is not current, you may miss a critical mailing. The statement of organization may be filed either by hand delivering or mailing it to either the Springfield or Chicago offices, by fax or by email at d1.elections.il.gov. Congratulations, you have now learned how to complete and file a D1. Once registered, your committee will now have to periodically file disclosure reports, including but not limited to A1 reports of $1,000 or more and quarterly reports. For more information, please see our other campaign disclosure tutorials and publications or contact campaign disclosure staff in either our Springfield or Chicago offices. Thank you.